From CAFE, welcome to Stay Tuned. I'm Preet Bharara. She felt strongly that the cause that she was pursuing was a noble one. Therefore, all the cheating along the way to get there, in her mind, I think, was perfectly justifiable because the cause was so noble. That's John Carreyrou talking about Elizabeth Holmes, founder of the disgraced healthcare startup Theranos. John's latest book is called Bad Blood. It's all about Holmes and how she fooled people for years with a promise that she would revolutionize the healthcare industry. In Bad Blood, Carrie Rue explains how she got away with it for so long and how she was eventually exposed and is now charged with federal crimes. I speak with John about uncovering a scam, why so many competent people fell for Theranos, and the incredible reporting drama he faced personally while covering Holmes. But first, let's get to your questions. First question comes from Susan Delinko, who asks in Twitter, uh, at Preet Bharara, love your podcasts. Is it legal for Omarosa or anyone else to tape President Trump without his permission? And that's a great question. You know, the first thing I'll say is, it's pretty remarkable, isn't it? How many people who are close to the president and claim to have loyalty to the president, nonetheless, secretively tape the president? We have Michael Cohen. We have Omarosa. Uh, I, as you might remember, very early in the podcast, talked about, you know, potentially taping the president when he called me. And instead, I chose not to return the call. And 20 hours later, I was asked to resign. But there's a reason for all of that. And, and, and there's a reason why Jim Comey took contemporaneous notes. You know, people don't believe that Donald Trump will tell the truth about conversations he has with people. And so it's maybe not cool, and in some ways not kosher, to tape the president, to tape your boss, and to be secretive about it, or to tape the chief of staff, John Kelly, but just remember that the reason for that is even people who believe that Donald Trump may temporarily have their back don't trust that he'll be honest about conversations in the future. So that's just an important background point. And I am pretty confident, I don't know, but I'm pretty confident, we'll learn about other people who tape the president over the course of time because they want it as an insurance policy as to their own honesty and truthfulness about conversations. Now, the question as to whether it's legal to tape the president, you know, it depends on where the taping happened. Like New York, I understand that District of Columbia is a one-party consent jurisdiction, which means so long as one party, and that could be the person doing the taping, consented to the taping, it's lawful. Uh, whether it goes against policy or whether it's a, a breach of ethics is potentially a different matter, but it's, it's lawful. Now, at the time of this recording, which is about lunchtime on Wednesday, we've only heard, I think, a, a sampling of recordings that Omarosa has made, uh, and she's dripping them out one at a time in sort of, um, you know, reality fashion way, which is apparently our country now. But the one that has received the most attention in some ways is the recording she made of her own termination conversation with Chief of Staff John Kelly in the Situation Room. And lots of people, I think, are correctly extremely concerned about that because it's a total breach of security. Uh, you're not supposed to have recording devices in certain places. And among the places you're not supposed to have recording devices is in any place called the SCIF, uh, which is simply an acronym for Sensitive Compartmented Information Facility, where classified information can be discussed without worry that you're being eavesdropped on by nefarious people, foreign powers, etc. And maybe the most sensitive SCIF in the country is the Situation Room in the White House. But one thing I think people need to understand, unlike going to an airport or going to Yankee Stadium, even when you go through a metal detector to go into a particular location, we had a skiff in my office, in the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York. Uh, I've been to skiffs in the Department of Justice in the National Security Division. And one time I was actually in the Situation Room in the White House. You know, those things operate on an honor system because the people who have legitimate access to rooms like that are already vetted, already have security clearances, already are entrusted with incredibly sensitive, important decision-making responsibilities like assistant U.S. attorneys in my office or FBI directors or people who are on the national security staff of the president. So the understanding is they follow the instructions that you're supposed to follow before you enter a skiff, like the Situation Room. There's generally speaking, you know, a box outside where people take off their iPhone, their BlackBerry, their iPad, put it in a box, lock it up, and then go into the Situation Room. I was never, you know, searched or patted down when I went into skiffs at the Department of Justice or anywhere else. You just trust the people to do the right thing. And so here, you know, I don't know if they're going to adopt a more stringent policy, 
because it seems that lots and lots of people who work for the president don't follow the rules. So people are right to be upset. Now, to be clear, this conversation in the Situation Room was about a personnel issue, and it was not about, you know, troop movements or threats to the United States or something classified. But if you have a culture in a White House where someone like Omarosa feels comfortable taking a cell phone or a recording device into the Situation Room, it makes you worry about how many other people have taken a device into the Situation Room when the discussion was not simply about someone getting fired, but something far more sensitive, far more perilous to the country. And you really hope that's not happening. And here's, by the way, one more question I have. How do we know, and can we be certain, that Donald Trump himself, who is fairly attached to his mobile device, how do we know that he has not taken his own cell phone into the Situation Room and into other sensitive places when incredibly... Uh, confidential, top secret, classified information is being discussed. Do you think someone's asking him, Mr. President, could you hand me your phone to put in the box while we have this conversation? I haven't heard anybody ask that question, but I'm starting to wonder about that myself and what kind of security breach that is. Uh, We have another Omarosa question, God help us, from Twitter. User FishEyeView, it's a pretty good view, writes, quote, if Trump had staffers and appointees sign personal NDAs, is that a conflict with the Constitution? Would these NDAs hold up in court if a staffer or appointee were called to testify in a matter involving the presidency? Fish Eye View, thank you for your question. When you say NDA, you're obviously referring to something that's known as a non-disclosure agreement. Things that are pretty common in the private world, people who go work for you know uh, tech companies uh, and other places where there's a concern about intellectual property and trade practices and trade secrets are very often required to sign non-disclosure agreements so they can't sort of come in as a spy for another company Uh, steal information, and then make a profit on it or give it to competitors. That's one example in which NDAs are very common. We know from a lot of reporting and books that have been written that Donald Trump, as was his right, you know, in his private businesses, had a lot of people sign non-disclosure agreements, which were not simply non-disclosure agreements, but also sort of non-disparagement agreements. So they couldn't say anything bad about uh, Donald Trump or about the employees or about the company. Uh, And you imagine why that is because he and his companies did a lot of seemingly shady things, as we're coming to learn. For an NDA to be required for people who come to work for the White House in particular, or in government generally, but particularly the White House, is an extraordinary thing. And as news has come out that the White House has made basically everybody at some point sign an NDA, I think we should be concerned about that. First of all, the people in the White House, uh, they're accountable to the president, yes, And they serve at the will of the president, yes. But they are public servants who are ultimately answerable to the people. And the communications they engage in and the information that they have is in some ways the property of the public. And I know no lawyer, myself included, who thinks that you can actually enforce a non-disclosure agreement on the part of somebody who's a public servant working in the White House outside of classified information. Now, it's standard practice for people who have access to classified information to sign something to make clear that they have an obligation to keep that information secret going forward. And that's what leads to sometimes criminal investigations and other things. But in an abundance of caution, people are often asked to make sure that they understand they sign on a line which is dotted about classified information. But beyond that, I think there's a very powerful argument, and every expert that I've seen opine on it in the recent week has agreed that it's potentially, yes, in conflict with the Constitution, especially the First Amendment protection of people, you know, to say things after their employment. So when you say, would these NDAs hold up in court if a staffer or appointee were called to testify in a matter involving the presidency, I don't think the NDAs would hold up if somebody, you know, went on a TV show and talked generally about their experiences and decided to say, well, there was a lot that was chaotic in the White House or that President Trump uh, had a terrible temperament. So long as you're not revealing secret information that could harm the national security of the country. I have yet to see an expert say otherwise. And in fact, if you believe the reporting, the White House counsel himself, Don McGahn, indicated to the president and to others uh, that he asked to sign such documents that they were not enforceable. And one of the ways he got people to be comfortable signing such a document was the sort of side conversation that he apparently had with people saying, don't worry about it, it's not enforceable. And basically, we're asking people to sign it because it makes the boss happy that boss being Donald Trump. So 
you know, overall, I don't think this is going to stand in the way of the public getting information that it's supposed to get. And I don't think anybody's First Amendment rights are going to be abridged because these things are unenforceable. But it tells you another sad example of people deciding to do things that are questionable, that don't make any legal sense, and in some ways are contrary to law because President Trump, out of a concern because of his paranoia and secrecy and non-traditional ways of doing things, many of which I think are bad, needs to be placated. Somebody suggested today, and I haven't thought about it deeply enough to have an opinion, that to the extent Don McGahn, the White House counsel, who's a member of the bar, was asking people to sign a document that he thought was legally unenforceable, is that an ethical violation on his part? Has he violated some oath as a member of the bar? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's a good question to ask. Next question, also a tweet, comes from Ted Hattimer, who asks, I just read that Manafort's defense attorney called no witnesses to testify on his client's behalf. Is this common? And what is the legal thinking behind calling no witnesses? Thanks. Love your podcast. So caveat right off the bat, we are taping this at about noon on Wednesday. And as we are taping this, the government and the Manafort team are doing their summations in federal court in the Eastern District of Virginia. I think they're going to finish today. And then the jury gets the case after the judge gives legal instructions. We could have a verdict anytime. Um, I think the case went well for the government. I think it's a very strong case. I don't think the defense damaged Rick Gates as much as they hoped to or needed to in order to prevail in this case. And there are a lot of documents that show, I think, Manafort guilty of some of the crimes that don't even need corroboration from Rick Gates. So if you're listening to this and there's a verdict and I was wrong, forgive me. But as to your question, it's a common one and not everyone has the same view. So I'll just give you my personal view and my experience. And I've seen some people on TV say something different and say it was shocking or incredibly surprising that Manafort didn't put on a defense. I don't, I don't think so at all. In fact, I, I think I haven't done a tally, but in many, many cases uh, that I tried myself or that I presided over or that I witnessed, the defense doesn't put on a case because remember, the burden of proof is a high one for the government. And it's not proof uh, by a preponderance of the evidence in a criminal case. It's not more likely than not. It's proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is really, really high. And I think a lot of smart defense lawyers would prefer to make their arguments in summation and say, look, these dots don't connect, and this witness was lying. You know, it's a little bit of a back of the hand. And, you know, bear in mind that sometimes in a very strong case by the government, there is a strategy for the defense to do less. Because once you put on a defense, then you're subjecting that defense to attack as well. So in in my first, very first trial that I ever had, I think the defense lawyer, and we had a weak case in a gun possession matter, that the defense lawyer thought, you know, he's got to explain to the jury how it was that his client, the defendant, didn't possess the gun and someone else possessed the gun. So the theory in my case was that the defendant we had charged uh, was in possession of a firearm, which was unlawful because he had been a felon. Uh, We didn't have great evidence of that. And the witness, you know, clearly had problems that we put on the stand. And I think the defense should have done what Manafort's lawyers did in this case, which was simply to argue that we had not met our burden of proof, that we didn't have enough evidence. And instead, The defense lawyer, who is a very excellent lawyer and is now a sitting judge, decided he needed to explain to the jury that his client was not the possessor of the gun, but someone else who he hadn't called to testify possessed the gun. What that enabled me to do was not only argue that we had sufficient evidence, it also allowed me to blast a hole in the defense theory, because the defense theory was actually ridiculous. So, you know, sometimes it's the case that less is more. Even though the defense has no burden of proof, And the burden doesn't shift, even though the defense decides to speak in its own defense by putting on witnesses and documents and everything else. Jurors are human beings, and they're going to expect that once the defense decides to put on a case, rather than claim the government didn't meet its proof, if the the defense decides to put on a case, they're going to expect that all their nagging questions about guilt and unresolved discrepancies and gaps are going to be addressed and effectively rebutted. So in some ways, you either need to bring it home when you put on your defense or not. And that's not true in all cases, but it's my general sense. And then the question about whether or not Manafort testifies, I think in the vast majority of cases that that I remember being involved with in federal court, the defendant doesn't testify. And in Manafort's case, I think it made sense for him not to testify because uh, he had a lot to answer for. And the ability to cross-examine on things that didn't come out in the main government case is significant. And from what we know about Manafort, he may not have made a very good witness and may not have made a sympathetic witness. 
you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't always matter. In a case that I've talked about here on, on the show recently, my office, when I was the U.S. attorney, charged and convicted at trial uh, Dean Skelos, who was the Senate Majority Leader, Republican, in New York State. In the first trial, where he was convicted fairly quickly, the defendant did not testify. Dean Skelos gave no testimony, did not talk about you know, what he did and how it was not unlawful. In the retrial that happened just recently, he changed his mind, changed his strategy, and he did testify, got convicted anyway. So sometimes what matters is the underlying strength and clarity of the government's case and whether or not the defense puts on a case or not may not ultimately make the difference. Chad Fegley writes, Hey, Ed Preet Bharara, with the news of the Strzok firing coming out today, what are your thoughts on the FBI going further than the IG report recommendation of a 60-day suspension, demotion, by firing him? Thanks, love the show. Uh, so, Chad, you're talking about Special Agent Peter Strzok of the FBI, who very famously has been attacked by the President of the United States, who was one of the people in charge of the Hillary Clinton email investigation and other investigations, who was sending you know, anti-Trump text messages to someone he was having a relationship with, also at the FBI, Lisa Page. And there's a lot of controversy about what Agent Strzok did, how he comported himself. And bear in mind that the record reflects that as soon as Agent Strzok's uh, conduct and texts came to be known to Bob Mueller, he was removed from the Russia investigation and the Russia case. So his conduct was serious. It was unprofessional. I don't know anybody who doesn't think it was undeserving of a rebuke. I don't have a particularly strong view of what the right result should have been in the absence of all this character assassination by the President of the United States and politicians on TV and talking heads. It could be that maybe what he did, you know, private messages expressing a a personal political standpoint on various things was not deserving of much of a rebuke at all. It could be that given how important the FBI's reputation is, that it's reasonable for someone who has brought such disrepute to the FBI to be terminated. You know, I I don't know all the facts, but I think what he did was serious and needed, you know, some kind of discipline. But what I think is awful and what I think is terrible and what I think makes it impossible to know if this was done ethically and correctly and fairly is that the president himself, by name, was attacking and basically asking for this result, in the same way he did it against Andy McCabe, who's the deputy director of the FBI, on the eve of his being able to fully vest in his pension. And that's gross, and that's disgusting. The problem with people like the president weighing in on Twitter, rather than letting the professional uh, ethics folks and disciplinary folks at the various agencies do their work quietly um, and without interference, is that it's impossible to know if it was a political decision or not. He throws all of that into question. And that needs to stop. My guest this week is John Carreyrou. As a journalist, John has won two Pulitzer Prizes, and his reporting helped lead to the downfall of Theranos, the blood testing company led by Elizabeth Holmes. We talk about his book on Holmes, Bad Blood, and why so many people, including General James Mattis, were pulled into her scam. That's coming up. Stay tuned. WordPress powers more than 30% of all websites, from your favorite local shops to the world's biggest companies. Join a global high-traffic network of organizations and entrepreneurs when you build your website and your business your way on WordPress.com. WordPress allows you to carve out your own corner of the web with a new custom domain name or use one that you already own. Create a site that fits you using templates and customizable themes. No design experience necessary. You can import and export content on your WordPress site easily. It's your site and your content. Use a range of e-commerce options to promote and sell from an easy-to-use payment button to a full-fledged online store. WordPress makes it easy to reach a global market and let customers find you. With built-in SEO, your site is search-friendly and ready for the world. Plus, you can get your website up and running for just $4 a month. The time to grow your business is now. Build your website today and get 15% off any new plan purchase at wordpress.com slash preet. That's wordpress.com slash preet for 15% off your brand new website. Wordpress.com slash preet. Hiring is challenging. 
But there's one place that you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash Preet. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invite them to apply to your job. ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. With results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Preet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash P-R-E-E-T. ZipRecruiter.com slash Preet. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. John Carreyrou, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. So I, I, I got to say, um, I just finished reading your book in the nick of time for this interview, Bad Blood. It is a fantastic read. It goes by really fast. So I want to congratulate you on the success of the book. And largely, I want to talk about this massive fraud that was unfolding, you know, basically in the public eye. But you're the one who really got to the heart of it based on, you know, really sharp investigative reporting work that you did. For people who may not be familiar, could you just sort of begin by telling us, you know, who is Elizabeth Holmes and what is or was Theranos? Right. And actually, it wasn't in the public eye until recent years, because the thing about Theranos is, is it was founded quite a while ago, back in 2003. And Elizabeth Holmes was a Stanford sophomore who dropped out and decided she was going to pursue this vision of building a startup around a diagnostic uh, device, a portable blood testing device that would do the full range of blood tests off just a drop or two of blood pricked from a finger. And for the the first 10 or so years, really, of uh, Theranos' existence, uh, she was operating under the radar, and she uh, even referred to the the mode they were in as stealth mode. Mm -hmm. She really uh, rose to fame for the first time in late 2013, early 2014, when she launched her technology, i.e. her uh, finger stick blood tests, in Walgreens stores in Palo Alto and, and in the Phoenix area in Arizona. And at that point started uh, drawing uh, quite a bit of media coverage. And in one of those stories in in mid-2014 by Roger Parloff of Fortune, it was revealed that the company had achieved a $10 billion, $9 or $10 billion valuation, that she had kept half the equity. So suddenly here was... she was a self-made multi-billionaire. Right. She was worth almost $5 billion, and she was sort of the, the first female tech founder in Silicon Valley who'd risen that high and become that wealthy and was joining the pantheon of these, right. you know, these, these men, uh, the Zuckerbergs and the Larry Pages and Sergey Brins and before them, you know, Jobs and Ellison, et cetera. What was the promise and the special thing about this technology for drawing blood? Like, why was it such a big deal? Right. I mean, to some, it may not seem like such a big deal to be able to run a, a bunch of blood tests off a tiny sample of blood. But actually, if you know anything about uh, blood testing, that is something that thousands of researchers in, in industry and academia have been trying to do for decades. If it were possible, uh, it would have clear uses, such as for cancer patients who get stuck a lot with needles or infants to be able to just prick a, a tiny bit of blood and, and run a battery of tests for, for a newborn child is great. And elderly patients, uh, applications in the field, you know, in, in Africa. In the battlefield, too. In the, in the battlefield. So um, uh, for reasons that we can get into, no one had cracked this nut. And she claimed to, to have done so. And, and she claimed, you know, that, that she could run as many as 70 tests 70 different blood tests simultaneously off one drop of blood and that her machine could run the full gamut of blood tests. And if you ask lab experts what the full gamut of blood tests means, it's anywhere from several hundred to several thousand blood tests. So tell us a little bit more about Elizabeth Holmes herself. What, what drove her to pursue this particular vision? Right. So she grew up uh, in, in a, what I would call an upper middle class family with an actually an interesting uh, background uh, on her father's side. She, she was descended from the Fleischmann-Yeast dynasty. By the turn of the 20th century, the Fleischmann and Holmes 
families were some of the, the richest people in America. Unfortunately, um, her father's grandfather and father uh, had lived large but flawed and, and sort of decadent lives and squandered much of that wealth. Her father very much uh, let her know about this great entrepreneurial dynasty that she was from, and I think uh, communicated to her the expectation that she, that she would follow in their footsteps. He himself, uh, Chris Holmes, her father, had been a civil servant. I think he and and his wife raised Elizabeth with uh, the pressure to achieve and to sort of reclaim their ancestors' uh, success and wealth, but also with this notion that she should do good and that she should live a purposeful life. Am I correct that, as you recite in the book, that over time, she began to present herself even to her own employees? I think the phrase you use is, is a world historical figure. She didn't actually say that. She didn't say it explicitly, but her employees began, some of them at least, uh, became convinced that she saw herself as a world historical figure, a yeah. sort of... What does uh, that mean? <laughs> like some someone who really puts a dent in the universe and is remembered uh, as a significant a person of their era in history books. She wanted to be remembered for someone who, who really had invented something and had, you know, changed science. You know, unfortunately, it was all channeled through the prism of Silicon Valley's culture, and Silicon Valley's culture, if you go back 40, 50 years, has always uh, included a lot of fake it until you make it. And her idol was Steve Jobs. Uh, she absolutely uh, idolized Jobs and Apple. And she really modeled herself after him uh, to the point of, you know, wearing the same attire she, she took to wearing black turtlenecks. And, and she also uh, embraced, you know, this ethos of like, it's okay to you know, sort of get it right or, you know, iterate. And so within, you know, within 18 months, two years of starting Theranos in 2003, she was already starting, trying to start to commercialize a blood testing system that absolutely did not work. But fooled a lot of people along the way. Right, because uh, starting in those early days, 2005, 2006, she started doing false demos, faked demonstrations of the product, whereby investors would come around to uh, Theranos' East Palo Alto office at the time, they were doing microfluidics, or they were attempting to do microfluidics. And so the, the investors would see on the screen uh, the blood running through these little channels and the cartridge that would, that would be inserted into this bigger part of the device called the reader. And then they would go to another room, and uh, they would be shown the result from the blood test. And actually, the result was a pre-recorded result from one of the times that the machine had worked. So it was a half-faked uh, demonstration. So so much of this was utter fraud. It is clearly to us when, when we look back on it. But I think in Elizabeth Holmes's mind, this is the way an entrepreneur operated in Silicon Valley. You tried to work on something. You got it to sort of work, not really, but you kept raising money, pretending that you had gotten it to work. And eventually you hoped that the reality of the technology's development would catch up with the promises made to investors. In the last couple of months, Elizabeth Holmes has been charged criminally by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of New York. In that case, is pending and she's presumed innocent. But Northern we'll see what... District of California. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help myself. Freudian slip. Northern District of California. Uh, she's been charged criminally with wire fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud, along with her former boyfriend and uh, somebody who helped her run the firm. But it, this is sort of different. You know, in reading the book and thinking about some of the characters that I encountered doing my work as a prosecutor, the way you describe it, she's sort of different from Bernie Madoff, uh, although there's some similarities in presenting herself uh, in a particular way and in social circles as well. But Bernie Madoff never thought that ultimately I'm going to make this right. You know, he was ripping people off, taking their money, pretending that, he, that investments were being made with their money over time and generating these false brokerage statements. She, on the other hand, you know, to engage in a taxonomy of fraud, you think, at least at the beginning, was hoping to make something real, ultimately. Um, I think in her mind, she continued to think that eventually they were going to get there with the technology and all the corners they cut along the way and all the lies she told wouldn't matter in the end because when they got there, Theranos would be recognized as a titan of Silicon Valley, would have disrupted medicine, 
and she would be as well known as, as Zuckerberg and others and feted, really all the cheating that had gotten her there wouldn't happen. And, and if you look at uh, one of her early backers, Larry Ellison, you know, he was absolutely famous in the early days of Oracle for totally over-promising about what the Oracle database software could do and for shipping early versions of that software that was crawling with bugs. And and so in her mind, she she was going to follow that that playbook. And so I've actually recently come to learn this expression that I think applies well to her. Uh, and that expression is uh, noble cause corruption. She felt strongly that the cause that she was pursuing was a noble one. Therefore, all the cheating along the way to get there in her mind, I think, was perfectly justifiable because the cause was so noble. Also known as the ends justify the means. Yes. But along the way, in order to get you know, more respectability and more investment, she collected a who's who of famous people, mostly men, who believed in her and her vision. Why don't take us through a list of some of those people who either became members of the board or made huge investments or who otherwise vouched for this unproven technology. Right. And so I just want to start by making a distinction between the early investors and the later investors. You could say that all the investors who came in during those first three rounds were early investors who knew, um, you know, what the lay of the land was. Theranos was a brand new company. Like all startups, the odds that it would succeed were low. On the other hand, uh, most of the money that Theranos raised and that Elizabeth Holmes raised came in the later rounds after the fall of 2013, after Theranos went live with its finger stick tests, $700 million of the billion dollars was raised at that point. And the reason that was outright fraud is she used the fact that she had commercialized the technology, that she had gone live with it in stores in, in California and Arizona to say to these new prospective investors, obviously, our technology is real. We've gone live with it. Patients are using it. How could it not be real? And I think people... And, and on top of that, we have people like former Secretary of State George Shultz. Right. We have media baron uh, Rupert Murdoch. Right. We have yep. the person who would become the future uh, Defense Secretary, General Mattis. And they're associated with great integrity. You don't always agree with you know their, their views, depending on your political stripe. But that's an impressive group. As you recite in your book, missing from the board was anyone who actually was an expert on blood. That's right. And, you know, in, in hindsight, that was an enormous red flag. In any case, that board did serve its purpose because uh, one investor in particular uh, was a hedge fund based in San Francisco that put in almost $100 million in early 2014. And one of, the, one of the factors that swayed them into investing was that sterling board. And then, of course, you know, people uh, such as Rupert Murnock, whom you mentioned, and Betsy DeVos, our current education secretary, the heirs to the uh, Walmart fortune, the, the Waltons, uh, put in $150 million. Explain something that I think is fascinating in the story, how she got the trust of so many folks. What was the, what was the nature of the force of her personality and her demeanor? Right. Well, I would say that um, the pattern that emerged early on was that she would win the backing of someone who uh, was older and who had prestigious accomplishments and therefore a good reputation. And, and the first person she did that with was her uh, Stanford Engineering School uh, professor, Channing Robertson, who was a, a star of the, the Stanford faculty. And he gave her credibility when she went and met with VCs early on. And so she then uh, pivoted, so to speak, to George Schultz. Uh, the former Secretary of State, who whose house is right uh, off the Stanford campus. And when he heard from Elizabeth, you know, about her product and what she claimed it could do, he was really entranced and uh, in short order joined her board and then introduced her to all his buddies at the Hoover Institution, the, the conservative think tank on the Stanford campus. And that's how she got to know Kissinger and, and Nunn and, and all these other guys with sterling resumes. And one after the other, they joined the board in exchange for grants of stock. Right, but, but she had to have a certain kind of personality to right. get these, these very smart people who had dealt with issues of war and peace and life and death. How does that happen? Well, first of all, she's very smart. She's a very smart woman. Uh, and she's got charisma. And she's uh, an incredibly talented pitch woman. She truly did believe in this vision of, of this device. And, and 
accomplishing this vision. And so, uh, you know, she won uh, people over with her enthusiasm, with her intelligence, with her charm. I, I think it's, you know, no coincidence that starting with uh, Channing Robertson and going all the way through to Rupert Murdoch and David Boyce, that they were all older men. And if you take George Schultz in particular, you know, he's 97 now. When he first met her, I think he was 91 or 92. He's a man of great accomplishments, but I don't think many uh, 20-something-year-old attractive blondes were hanging out with him. I'm not suggesting anything um, inappropriate sexually, but I think uh, it can't be denied that, that, you know, these older white men, one after another, fell under this, this young, attractive, charismatic woman's spell. And then, uh, at some point, she becomes a little bit more famous, in part, because of a piece that's written in the paper that you work for, the Wall Street Journal. How did that come about? Right. So by then, uh, she had become friends uh, with George Schultz. He had joined her board. He had become her biggest champion. And in 2012, came and visited the Wall Street Journal's editorial board. But at the end of that meeting, he mentioned, by the way, I know this, this amazing young woman who's uh, come up with this incredible medical invention. She's very reclusive, and she's been in stealth mode up until now. But I'm getting the feeling that she's going to be ready to sort of present it to the world soon. Would you guys be interested? And so Paul Jagot, who's the, the longtime um, editorial page editor at the journal, said, sure, I'll send a writer when she's ready. And a year later, George Schultz and, and Theranos came back to the Wall Street Journal editor page and said, Elizabeth Holmes is ready. And why was Elizabeth Holmes ready? Because she was on the cusp of launching her finger stick tests in Walgreens stores. And so she wanted to make a splash in the media to coincide with that launch. And so an a, a editorial page writer named Joe Rago flew out to Palo Alto and interviewed her and then wrote a very uh, friendly sort of profile of her in the, in the editorial pages uh, that essentially took uh, everything she told him about the capabilities of her technology at face value. So now we fast forward from that interview, which was August of 2013, published in September of 2013, to early 2015. And by then, Elizabeth Holmes has become a, a household name in Silicon Valley. She's everywhere. She's, you know, friends of mine right. would talk about her, uh, women in particular, because she was someone to look up to, self-made uh, billionaire. You know, part of the attraction of it was that it was not just sort of some software that could make someone rich, but it was going to have a positive impact on people's lives medically. Part of that is the journalists who covered her and who wrote about her didn't really come from a medical reporting background. And she had presented herself as, you know, the heir apparent to Steve Jobs in the Silicon Valley tradition. And I guess uh, those reporters who covered her earlier on accepted that portrayal of herself as a tech figure as opposed to a medical figure. Right, although you're not a medical reporter either. Well, I'd spent a lot of time over the, the previous 10 years uh, reporting on medicine and doing a lot of investigative reporting on healthcare and medicine. The previous year, as part of a, a series, uh, a few colleagues and I had done on Medicare fraud. And in the course of reporting one of those stories, I had uh, come across a, a pathologist in Missouri who wrote a, an obscure blog that he called the Pathology Blog which he spelled B-L-A-W-G. Because uh, <laughs> how else would you spell it? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> right. I, I'm an avid reader of that blog as well. It was a, an obscure blog, but it did come across my radar, and I reached out to him because I needed someone to explain to me certain complexities about laboratory billing for that Medicare uh, fraud series. Right. And he obliged, and then, um, you know, we weren't in contact for another six or eight months, and suddenly, in early 2015, he comes to me and he says have you read this recent New Yorker magazine profile of a woman named Elizabeth Holmes and her startup, Theranos? And as it turned out, I had. I'd found that story interesting, but there'd also been uh, some things in it that struck me as odd. Uh, the main one being the notion that um, college dropout can just drop out with very little, if any, training in medicine and then go on to pioneer new medical science. Um, can we pause there? Yeah. So... You know, you, you are a very smart guy. You're not a scientist by training. Not at all. But you have a suspicious mind. Like why, why is it that, because I think it's, it's important and impressive, and I wonder why we don't have more people like that. I, so you, it's fair to say I have you, a suspicious mind. I'm, I'm a skeptic. I mean, is that what it is? You're, you're a skeptic? Meanwhile, all these other people who had achieved great fortune 
and accomplishments in life and served presidents of the United States of America? How come they didn't have the same suspicion that you have? Well, first of all, all these people who, who uh, jumped on her bandwagon, there, there are very few, if any, who had any background whatsoever in medicine and much less laboratory science. So I, I at least had that advantage, which is that I'd spent much of the previous 10 years reporting on this stuff. Do you, do you attribute your initial suspicion to having that background or to just sort of common sense skepticism? I think it was a combination of both, but it was certainly informed by my uh, medical reporting expertise. I mean, one of the things You're that... Letting those guys off the hook. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, one of the things in the New Yorker piece, which which uh, the New Yorker writer pointed out, and there were, by the way, a few skeptical paragraphs in that New Yorker profile, you know, Theranos had never really published any studies in peer-reviewed literature. And I couldn't think of any great advance in medicine that had not involved publishing your discovery in, in peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers. So that was one red flag. So uh, when he told me of his own skepticism, and this obviously doc, this doctor, the pathology the blogger, doc, uh -huh. and he knew a thing or two about blood testing, certainly knew more about it than I did, he came to me with other information, which was that uh, he, after the New Yorker story, he had written a short skeptical blog item on his blog. And this blog item had been seen by a guy named Richard Fuse. And Richard Fuse uh, is a former childhood neighbor of Elizabeth Holmes who had gotten into a patent litigation battle with her. And he had uh, ultimately been steamrolled by Elizabeth and Theranos, um, who had hired David Boyes, the famous lawyer, uh, to represent them. And, and Boyes had steamrolled Fuse. And in the course of that three-year litigation, Fuse had become convinced that Theranos was a scam. And by the way, Fuse is a trained medical doctor with uh, a number of patents to his name. And So you talked to him also? So I, I learned that the pathology blogger had been approached by Fuse and that Fuse was alleging that this thing, meaning Theranos, was a scam. In addition, I also heard that Fuse had recently himself made contact with an employee of Theranos who had just left Theranos. And it was a key employee. It was the laboratory director. So I was hearing third hand through the pathology blogger that there was this guy named Richard Fuse who himself felt Theranos was a scam and who not only had that hunch, but had talked to a primary source who was confirming that hunch to him. And so I thought this story could have legs if I can pull on this string and make contact with the primary source. And if I can confirm that the primary source is alleging wrongdoing and is alleging that this thing is a house of cards, then, you know, this could be a big story. Do you have like an investigative spidey sense? So at this moment, uh, you've been reporting for a long time. You have what, 11, 12 Pulitzers? How many? <laughs> I mean, I, I've been part of teams at the Journal that have won two Pulitzers. You're so, you're very modest. Two, two's two more than I have. At that moment, how are you feeling personally when you're hearing this information? Is it one of those things where, you know, it's happened 20 times before and it usually doesn't pan out? Or do you have some sense that this is really something? Well, I got to say that I get a lot of tips, and I think a lot of reporters get tips, and most of them don't pan out. I would say 9 out of 10, if not 19 out of 20, don't pan out. Uh, usually, you can tell pretty early on. In this case, I have to say that my ears immediately pricked up, because I was immediately aware of the implications of potentially a fraud at this company. One, you know, Silicon Valley is a big story. And this was one of the most value, valuable private unicorns in Silicon Valley, valued at nine or $10 billion. It had this, you know, uh, female founder, which was a rarity who who had achieved a star status in, in a short period of time. And then you had the public health dimension of this. If what I was hearing secondhand was true, and if this company not only didn't really have the technology um, that it claimed it had, but was also putting out unreliable test results, then uh, it meant that patients and potentially thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of patients were being put in harm's way. Because at that point, uh, the Theranos services had been rolled out in two stores in Northern California and about 41 others in Arizona. So, so then you talked to a lot of people. And among the other things you did, which I thought was fascinating, is you subjected yourself to blood tests. Right. Describe why you did that and how that went. Well, first of all, I wanted to uh, see if they were going to uh, prick me uh, and do the, the finger t stick tests or do the traditional needle uh, draw, because I'd heard from uh, the former laboratory director, who, by the way, goes by a, a pseudonym in the book, Alan Beam, 
I'd heard from uh, Alan that actually uh, a large proportion of the tests uh, were being done on on regular sized samples drawn venously from the arm. And what's the problem with that? That just went against the entire you know, glory and vision of what right. Theranos she, was putting forward. She had claimed in all these these interviews, and she claimed it even on, on her, the website of Theranos, that they were doing finger stick. And that supposedly... That was the whole point. Right, it was right. the whole point. So if they're doing Venus draws for many, if not the majority of the tests, that's already a, one huge hole in this Theranos myth. So I wanted to see that. And the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to compare my blood test results from Theranos to ones from a traditional laboratory. And so... If, Minutes after I exited the the Walgreens in Arizona where I got my uh, blood tested by Theranos, I drove to a LabCorp location and I wanted them to be close together so that, you know, um, Theranos wouldn't be able to say, well, you waited too long. You you didn't have a Big Mac in between. Right. And of course, I had fasted. And then um, later, uh, a week or two later, I got my test results from Theranos. I by then returned to New York. And I got the ones from LabCorp as well. And there were some discrepancies. Uh, One of them was that um, Theranos labeled my cholesterol measurements as optimal. That's why I'm going to go get tested at Theranos right after this. (laughs) (laughs) And and, uh, LabCorp actually said, you know, they weren't optimal, that they were high. The doctor who had given me my test order, who became a source for my story because she had come across questionable results for her patients from Theranos, she had had herself tested too. And her Theranos uh, results showed that she had Addison's disease, which is a very serious condition that can result in death if it's not treated. Her LabCorp results showed that she, you know, that value was perfectly normal. And so she had no doubt in her mind, having seen the other questionable results from scores of patients that she had seen, she had no doubt that the LabCorp result was the correct one and that she didn't have Addison's So here's the question I have, and maybe people listening have the same question. That seemed to be a very easy, common sense, smart, confirmable comparison test. Right. Why isn't the whole thing over at that point? Like, isn't it easy for everyone then to just confirm what what you tested and concluded and put these folks out of business? Right. So when we started confronting Theranos with this information, and I want to say I had at least a half dozen uh, patients' test results. Um, and I had uh, a handful of doctors participating on the record and saying that uh, they didn't trust the, the Theranos results and they felt the ones from the other labs were the correct ones. Uh, they told us, well, this is just a small sample. And by the way, there's a lot of variability traditionally between lab test results. And so basically... They had know, an excuse for everything. They had I mean, an excuse. Along the way, there, yeah. there are a hundred stories like this. We didn't accept that excuse. That said, we were mindful that we couldn't empirically prove that Theranos results were consistently inaccurate because it, it was, they were right. We only had a, a small sample. But we did feel we had enough to raise questions about the accuracy and reliability of tests, especially I also had these sources who had worked at Theranos, among them the ex-lab director, who were telling me that the Theranos machine could only do a handful of finger stick tests and that for all the others, or that at least for 80 other tests, they had hacked and basically modified regular Siemens machines to adapt them to small finger stick samples and that one of the things that they had done to adapt them was to dilute the finger stick samples to create more volume so that the probe that went down in the cup inside the Siemens machine couldn't reach the blood if it was a tiny sample. So what they did to get around that is they increased the volume by diluting the blood. The thing about the Siemens machine is it already has a dilution step as part of its protocol. And so that introduced more room for error. And it also reduced the concentration of the analytes uh, that the Siemens machine was trying to measure. It reduced them to a level that was so low that it was beneath the analytical measurement range that the FDA had approved for the machine. Theranos was not a small company in the later years. What happened to the people, if anything, who raised questions and raised doubts and were concerned about the ethics of what they were doing? Right. So there was a pattern uh, starting early on of uh, Elizabeth firing people. Lots and lots of people got fired. Hundreds of people got fired, um, especially after the fall of 2009 when her boyfriend, Sonny Balwani, joined. He became the number two executive, the president and chief operating officer. 
and um, he was very haughty uh, and demeaning with employees. Um, and uh, he took to firing people all the time to the point that it gave rise to a new expression at Theranos shortly after he came on board, which was uh, to disappear someone. If if a colleague was suddenly no longer there uh, in the morning, then it meant that Sonny had disappeared them. Before they were escorted out of the, the building, they were made very much aware of the fact that if they talked about anything they had seen while employed at Theranos, Theranos would come after them and sue them for violating their non-disclosure agreements. So you're putting together this article. They were very nice and open and transparent with you, I presume, and were uh, no, helpful to I you mean, and helped you? Qu- quite the opposite. I mean, they uh, <laughs> at first... when I, when Describe I, what happened right, and, and right. how hard they fought back against your reporting. Yeah, so I, I started looking into Theranos in early February of 2015, and by uh, mid to late April, I started... Uh, communicating with the company and wanting and asking for an interview with Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani. Did you ever get one? No. And they hired an outside PR guy who at first, for the first month or two, just put me off. And then it became apparent to them by June of uh, 2015 that I wasn't going away and that they had to deal with me. And so at that point, that took the form of David Boyes. uh, David Boyes is a prominent and powerful lawyer in America. Yep. Now, arguably one of the, the, the best known lawyers and most feared litigators in America. Although know, he does not have a podcast. I'm just <laughs> stating for the record, he does not have a podcast. That's all. And uh, he came with his henchmen uh, to the journal offices in late June 2015. Well, first of all, they told us that I had um, procured, you know, trade secrets from Theranos and that was that I had illegally procured them and that I needed to either destroy them or return them immediately. Uh, at the same time, they said that uh, my sources were unreliable, uh, were leading me astray, and um, they would not answer my questions about how many tests were done on their own technology versus uh, third-party commercial analyzers. Um, that was a trade secret. I mean, basically, we went around in circles for five hours in this conference room. Did they threaten you? Uh, they they had these two tape recorders at each end of the the conference table. It was very clear that they were approaching that meeting as uh, a deposition in, in a future legal. I, I just one, you should be aware. I am also taping this conversation. I'm aware. <laughs> okay. You know, and then in the ensuing days and weeks, we got uh, very uh, sternly, you know, worded letters from from boys um, telling us in no uncertain terms that if we continued with this story, that we would get sued for libel. Pretty soon I started um, uh, finding out that they had figured out who some of my confidential sources were and were putting the screws to them. Um, You know, I got a frantic call from one of them, this young woman named Erica Chung. She had been confronted in the parking lot of her new employer in Sunnyvale, California, by a a guy who had uh, presented her with an envelope, and the envelope contained a letter from David Boyes telling her that she needed to meet with him by a certain day and a certain time because... Uh, he and Theranos suspected she was uh, leaking trade secrets and they were going to sue her. And the the envelope had her name and underneath it had the address uh, of the house in East Palo Alto where she had been staying for less than two weeks. So do you think she, she was under surveillance? There was no other way. Her her mother didn't even know she, she was staying with this colleague at this place in East Palo Alto. The only person on earth who knew that was the colleague whose house it was. Do you believe at any point you were under surveillance? I would say it's probable. I wouldn't be surprised at all if I find out that I was. I am certain that Erica was. I'm certain that Tyler was. Tyler Schultz was another one of my confidential sources. As it turned out, he's uh, George Schultz's grandson, and George Schultz was on the board of of Theranos. So it was uh, this uh, strange situation where one of my confidential sources was the grandson of of a famous board member. Tyler went dark on me uh, before we published the first story. I had no idea what was happening. I suspected they were putting the screws to him. And what I learned later is that they ambushed him, they meaning two uh, attorneys for Boyce Schiller Flexner, ambushed him at his grandfather's house. And Do you think that the lawyers representing Theranos, based on your interactions and your reporting, behaved unethically in any way? I believe that uh, they uh, crossed lines I thought that uh, one guy in particular named Mike Brill, um, who is an associate of David Boyce's at Boyce Schiller Flexner, uh, the way he behaved uh, toward Tyler Schultz uh, was thuggish. Um, He hid upstairs along with another lawyer um, at George Schultz's house waiting for Tyler to show up. And Tyler had agreed to meet his grandfather 
uh, under the understanding that they would meet uh, face to face and there would be no lawyers involved. A few minutes after you arrived, uh, the, these Boyce Schiller attorneys, Mike Brill, uh, among them, uh, showed up, you know, browbeat him and, and tried to get him to admit he was a source of mine and tried to get him to sign these papers and threatened him. This went on for months. Tyler had to hire lawyers. You know, I'm told that at one point, Mike Brill threatened to bankrupt Tyler's entire family if he didn't sign the latest af- uh, uh, version of the affidavit. Yeah, and one interesting aspect of this is the boys firm, in lieu, I believe you wrote this, in lieu of fees, typical legal fees, right. took stock in the company. Yeah. And that's something that I learned later as well, or at least after my first story was published, that uh, during the, the Fuse patent litigation, the boys firm had been paid for its work in that litigation entirely in stock. And as a result, they had almost $5 million worth of Theranos stock. So by the time I came along and uh, David Boys was trying to convince the journal not to publish my story and was representing uh, Theranos effectively against me and the journal, uh, he was not only uh, a legal advocate for the company, he also had a financial stake in the company. And to me, that was a conflict of interest when when I learned of it, not to mention uh, the fact that uh, 10 days after my first story was published, he joined the board. He joined the board, right. right. Which compounded the conflicts of interest. Um, And people not only wrote strongly worded letters and tried to get people to stop by, you know, these methods that you described, they also went straight to the top, to Rupert Murdoch. Right. Who simultaneously was the head of the parent company that owns your paper, your employer, the Wall Street Journal. And also had made a $125 million investment in Theranos. Right. How did that turn out? When I started uh, looking into Theranos in February 2015, I did not know this, but basically at the same moment, uh, Rupert Murdoch, who, as you say, owns and controls News Corporation, which is the parent of the journal, was putting $125 million into Theranos, becoming its single biggest investor. I had no idea. Nor did he have any idea, I think, that, that I was beginning to, to dig into the company. But he was asked to kill the story. Later. Later. later so... Um, and, uh, and, he, and obviously, you're here. <laughs> he, he did not. He did not. Yet Elizabeth Holmes met with him uh, about four times before, four or five times before that first story was published in October of 2015. And during several of those meetings, she appealed to him. She told him, there's this guy at the journal who uh, has gathered false and misleading uh, information about us that he's threatening to publish. This is going to do great harm to our company. And (laughs) And, and presumably to your investment. Right. Which he ultimately had to get out of. And she kept bringing it up in the hope that he would offer to kill the story, and he never did. We're coming up to the end of our time. So one observation I have about the book and the story, and this is not a criticism, but it's, it's kind of surprising to me it doesn't seem to be anything re- redeeming about Elizabeth Holmes in the book. You know, in Shakespeare and in other stories of people who fall from greatness, there seems to be a little bit more complexity. And there are people who have some good motivations, and there are stories of things that they did, you know, acts of kindness, moments of grace, even though they're flawed and they commit crime and massive fraud on lots and lots of people. There's none of that in here about Elizabeth Holmes. What what do, you, what do you make of her and why she did what she did and what kind of person she is, you know, separate and apart from any crime she may have committed? What do you, what do you make of yeah, her as yeah. a person? Well, I would say that if there is something redeeming about her uh, and if you contrast her with a guy like Madoff or, or some of these other uh, mega fraudsters, I, I do believe that her vision was genuine. The, the ultimate vision of creating a, a diagnostic device that would be revolutionary and that would therefore, um, you know, uh, improve mankind, she really did believe in that vision. Unfortunately, she felt that that vision and achieving it justified everything that she did to get there. And, and I think that's where she got herself into trouble and that's where she turned bad. Do you think she understands what she did was wrong, or do you think she's still in that mode, even when things were falling apart, that she was right and everyone else is out to get her and everyone else is wrong? I'm not convinced that she understands that she did wrong and and that she understands the magnitude of the wrongdoing here. A uh, producer who works for Alex Gibney, uh, who, by the way, is working on a, a Theranos documentary for HBO that should come out early next year, 
uh, had dinner with her last fall, and she said to to this producer that she felt that she she hadn't done anything wrong, and that you know all she had tried to do was build a successful startup, and that uh, startups often fail, and that male startup founders often fail, and they're allowed to fail, and that she wasn't being allowed to fail. So not only is there a documentary being made about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes, but as we discussed before we started taping. There's a Hollywood movie being made. Is that right? That's right. Who's playing Elizabeth Holmes? Jennifer Lawrence. I've heard of her. Who's playing you? Oh, that's going to be determined at a later date, right? What's happening right now is um, Vanessa Taylor, uh, a screenwriter in Hollywood who co-wrote The Shape of Water with Guillermo del Toro, uh, is working on the screenplay. And um, she needs to finish the screenplay, hand it in, um, Adam McKay, who is the director attached to film the movie, to direct the movie, and is producing it, will then uh, have to get the screenplay green-lighted. And at that point, will the other uh, members of the cast be determined? I see. Well, if I can make a suggestion, if you need someone to play you, Paul Giamatti is an excellent choice. Oh, how about Mark Ruffalo? Who, also, who, also great. Who played a great investigative reporter in Spotlight. Uh, and also the Hulk. <laughs> that's, I, right. that's where I thought you were going. <laughs> John Carrie Rue, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. So now comes the time in the show to talk about something that affected me in the last week. And you may be thinking in the dog days of summer, I'm getting a little sappy, and maybe that's true. So yesterday was Tuesday, and I was thinking about doing something very radical that I had not done in many, many years, and that is to go watch a movie in the middle of the day. And I wasn't sure I should go do that, but then I got an email from my book editor at Kanaf, who had finally finished reading the first draft of the book that I handed in three weeks ago. And he said, among other things, quote, I'm very pleased, which is high praise from my editor. So thank you, Peter. And that put me in a really good mood. And I thought, why don't I now go ahead and watch a movie? And I decided to walk out into the hot New York City air. So I walked down to an old theater on 12th Street and 2nd Avenue in Manhattan to see a movie called Won't You Be My Neighbor? And I'd heard a lot about it and didn't know quite what to expect. And if you haven't heard about it, it's about a man named Fred Rogers, who, if you're of a certain age, you grew up with him on public television. And he had a show where he would basically come in every day, take off his jacket, put on a cardigan, change out of his work shoes, put on sneakers, and he would ask a simple question, which was, would you be my neighbor? It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this... So Fred Rogers comes up on the screen, someone who I haven't seen in decades or thought about in a very long time. And then my own childhood comes flooding back to me. It's sort of a transporting moment. You know, that same guy that I remember when I was a kid, he was very soft-spoken, looked directly into the camera, seemed like he was talking just to you. Uh, and it was an odd feeling to remember the puppets and to remember the games that he would play and to remember the stories that he would tell. And it kind of reminds you of a simpler time, I guess, although, as I was reminded in watching the movie, it was not a simple time at all. He addressed the issue of Robert Kennedy's assassination on the program, the issue of war in Vietnam on the program, the issue of racial tension and racial discrimination on the program. And I remember as a kid, I wasn't thinking about those things. I was just watching the show as an innocent child might. And as television was becoming, you know, more violent and there's lots of shooting. And as he says, lots of pie throwing, you know, people getting hit in the face with pies and lots of violence and shouting and yelling and speed and fast editing. Mr. Rogers show was simple and slow and kind. And you don't have a lot of that in the world anymore. And he talked about things that are values that I think people sometimes worry are a little bit missing today, like hope and love and tolerance and kindness. But then you also got to see how strong and steely this man was. There's a scene, and spoiler alert, so if you haven't seen it, you don't want to hear about this. But there's a scene in which there was a particularly curmudgeonly senator who, under the Nixon administration, was trying to cut funding to public broadcasting. And witness after witness at a hearing in the Senate made no mark on the senator. And then Fred Rogers came to testify. And he talked about this show. And he talked about the message of the show. And he talked about the importance of children and the importance of love for children. And literally, as the movie suggests, 
In that moment, the heart of this curmudgeonly senator was warmed, and he allowed the $20 million in funding, which was a big amount of money at the time, to go forward for public broadcasting. Know that there's something deep inside that helps us become what we can. For a girl can be someday a lady, and a boy can be someday a man. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. Looks like you just earned the $20 million. (laughs) You think this is a throwback film, and it's about the past, and it's about the 60s and the 70s when I was growing up. But then you realize the message of the movie couldn't be more contemporary, couldn't be more resonant to the present. He talks about how much in the world occurs because of love and because of a lack of love. And you don't hear that being talked about as much these days either. And it's important to see that, I think, jarring juxtaposition between what Fred Rogers was trying to communicate in an earnest, honest, almost boring way, and all the Sturm and Drang you see today. It's worth watching. Hi, television neighbor. Well, that's it for this episode of Stay Tuned. Thanks again to my guest, John Carreyrou. His book is Bad Blood. You should read it. If you like the show, rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. Send me your questions about news and politics. Tweet them to me at Preet Bharara with the hashtag AskPreet or give me a call at 669-247-7338. That's 669-24-PREET. Or you can send an email to Stay Tuned at cafe.com. Stay Tuned is presented by Cafe. It's produced by the team at Pineapple Street Media, Kat Aaron, Chris Barube, Henry Malofsky, Jenna Weiss-Berman, Joel Lovell, and Max Linsky. With help this week from Gabrielle Lewis. Our music is by Andrew Dost. And special thanks to Julia Doyle, Jeff Eisenman, Jake McAbee, and Vinay Basti. I'm Preet Bharara. Stay tuned. <laughs>